Welcome to Robotics and Automation News webinars, where you can be part of a global event without leaving your home or office. Attend our live webinars and communicate directly with influential professionals in your industry. Hello, my name is Abdul Montakim. I'm editor of roboticsandautomationnews.com. Uh, in this interview, I speak to Yong Xin Liang of Augmentus, which is a very sophisticated robot programming application or a company, that's a, a startup company, that's uh, released a, a highly sophisticated robot programming application. The software itself is uh, iPad native and uses the device's M1 chip, which is supposed to be super advanced. My name is Xin. I'm the CEO of, CEO of Momentus. Uh, so we are the company that provides uh, software that simplifies robot programming so that non-technical users like operators in the company can use it to program robots in minutes instead of weeks. Right, okay. Now, I've seen your website, which we'll go on to in a minute, and maybe we can elaborate mm. on, on that. But mm. um, uh, if you don't mind uh, explaining more about the software, what it does, it simulates, as far as I can tell, it simulates robots. It has virtual versions of actual robotic arms, for example, and robotic cells, and uh, I see them go through the process of, in the example that I, on the homepage, is painting something. One robot mm. is placing the object in the cell, and the mm. other robot's painting it. When the painting is finished, the other robot moves it. So what? that's one example. What, what are other examples of simulations can people do with, and mm. how complex can, can they become? Yeah, so what our, we adopt a methodology called scan and plan, whereby the user can take uh, the iPad with our software inside to do a 3D scan of the component at the end of the robot cell to create like a 3D model of the whole setup. So with this 3D model, they can actually use it as a basis to plan the robot movement. So for example, they can uh, use it, the virtual robot inside the 3D scan to determine how the robot will do spraying, to do polishing, to do sanding, as well as pick and place, all within uh, the comfort of the tablet. So it becomes very accessible and it also is also very portable, whereby the user can use it in the shop floor, can use it in the office or anywhere that they like. And this lowers the barrier entry or the difficulty for the user because the user first, they don't need the 3D model file, which can be a little bit hard to get sometimes, because they just need to use iPad to scan. And then uh, we have an intuitive interface whereby the user can drag the robot and teach it uh, offline instead of uh, on the actual robot. So the real robot can keep on moving to do production. And then the planning and the control of the robot can be done offline uh, without uh, directly affecting the operation of a robot. So in this way, uh, the company saves time and the, op the, op the operator has uh, less trouble uh, readjusting and configuring the robot. Yeah. Okay. So we are, yeah, so through one single interface, you can program different types of robots. Uh, so we are compatible with uh, robotic brands like ABB, Koka, Nachi, UR, uh, TM, and Chaka. And we are continuing to expand more but the whole objective is to lower the, bar uh, the difficulty so that anyone can just pick up the iPad with our app inside and get the, get the robots rolling. Okay, so let's have a look at the website. I, I really like hmm. the uh, design of it and, and how it was uh, animated. Um, let me, that's our YouTube channel. Uh, here we are, Augmentus now. Um, hmm. Uh, yeah, as I said, the, this is the uh, robotic cell that was uh, where you see one robot painting an object mm. and another picking and placing it on the appropriate uh, location. And there's mm. a tablet in front. I, I didn't um, really appreciate what you uh, appreciated when I saw the picture, but you mentioned the tablet in your answer. So... You would say, is it tablet-based application? Is it is it uh, an application that's only for iPad uh, mobile devices, mm. or is it 
is it uh, on desktop? Is it is it a cloud-based thing, or mm. or is it uh, uh, native? It's native to the iPad itself. Uh, mm. the, so there's no need for PC. Uh, there's no need for a bulky desktop. Uh, the reason why we build it on the tablet uh, is because it's more portable. And the reason why we chose iOS is because it's secure. Uh, during our previous line of work, then we realized that a lot of the big companies, MNCs, they prefer to use iOS because it's a, it's a trusted brand and it has tight cyber security. And therefore, that's why we stick to iPad. And with the recent advancement in the iPad, so right now we are, they are using the M1 chip, right? uh, which is uh, almost as powerful as a, a, like a MacBook. This allow us to do a very advanced robot uh, calculation, like kinematics, uh, like motion planning, uh, all within the tablet itself. So previously, this, all these very complex uh, algorithms and calculations could not be done on the iPad, but right now uh, it can be done and it's very efficient. That's uh, quite impressive. I mean, I don't know, I love a lot about computing, but I know enough to know that um, computer simulations like this animations uh, require a lot of memory and they heat up the computer that you're using. It really stresses the circuits out. Mine anyway, my computers mm -hmm. definitely get stressed out. And uh, I didn't think mobile devices would be capable mm -hmm. of this amount of simulation unless the simulation was done in the cloud and the um, mm. the device itself was simply kind of looking in on it, like a window into the into what the application is doing so you're saying it you're saying you said it's native or, or is on board the mm. ipad itself and you're using the m1 and that that's a very interesting um uh and do you do, do you think your kind of approach uh, your software uh, I mean it's obviously benefiting from advances in computing but what do you think mm. overall in general for this type of robotic simulation software uh, a few years ago not long ago it was very difficult to find um, it was very difficult to de develop and uh, supply to users in the way that you're doing now would you say that's right? And how, how things how have things developed over the last few years in robotic simulation? Um, how how long have you been going as well? How, how long have you? Uh, how, how long has it been since you started? Um, so I started two years ago in twenty nineteen. Uh, so after I started, uh, you know, uh, things wasn't so smooth sailing. Uh, because soon after we started, we were the COVID hit and things sort of like turned upside down. Uh, fortunately, we received an investment from a uh, venture capitalist, uh, Cocoon Capital, and that allowed us to focus on the product and less, uh, less worry about uh, money and expenses. And that gave us some time to really invest a lot of like uh, energy and time into perfecting the product. Uh, we are the first in the world to provide a uh, robot simulation on the tablet itself uh, because it's actually quite difficult to do all the work motion planning on the tablet, but we managed to do it because we kept the whole system very integrated and very efficient. And I would say the recent advancement in the uh, robot simulation is that there is a lot of movement uh, towards the no code kind of uh, user interface and more attention is being paid uh, to ensuring that the user experience is good. Conventionally, uh, robot simulation is reserved for like very experienced uh, robot uh, engineers. Uh, give me a moment. Okay, pardon. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so uh, previously, uh, there are a lot of uh, attention uh, being, uh, sorry, uh, previously, uh, robot, robotic simulation is only reserved uh, for the very experienced robotic developers who are very uh, knowledgeable in systems such as uh, ROS, uh, robot operating system, and they need to know like uh, programming languages like C++, C Sharp, and Python to be able to do robot simulation. However, uh, with the emergence of like uh, better hardware like iPad, uh, more powerful PC, and there's also emergence of like 
people wanting more graphical interfaces as we are more used to the newer generation of smartphones and the apps, then there is a need in the market that drives uh, more intuitive for programming. And this is also compounded by the recent trends uh, due to COVID, whereby uh, they are in the factory itself, there needs to be more uh, distances between one another uh, due to the social distancing rules. And that forces the companies to look at ways to still sustain the production while ensuring that the employees are safe. And therefore, a lot of them are looking for robotics as a way to complement the workforce, not replacing, but to complement so that uh, people can still stay safe uh, while they are working in the factories or, or in the plants. Hmm. I'm absolutely fascinated and very impressed. Uh, it looks great. And uh, the technical achievement of, um, as you say, being the first to bring it to iPad. Let me, let me be clear, the, the, uh, it's not on desktop at the moment. It's not available on desktop or any other hmm. format. It's just iPad. Yes, it's just iPad. It's not on the cloud either. It's everything is uh, native to the iPad. Luckily, I've got an iPad Pro, a tiny one, albeit. Uh, so I'm going to have a, maybe, do you have a demo version or a free trial version or anything like that? Uh, fortunately, I'm, I mean, unfortunately, we do not have a demo license. Uh, that is free of charge. Uh, so usually how we operate is that we work with system integrators or solution providers. Uh, then we integrate our solutions with them uh, so that uh, when they pass on their solutions to their end customers, uh, they can tag along our software so that uh, the end customers can reconfigure and reprogram the robots as and when uh, they like. Right. So, for example, an integrator will talk to a manufacturer. A manufacturer will say, I make furniture, for example, and I want robots mm. to do the assembly, for example. I want you to... Mm supply me with the robots and any other technologies necessary to do it and mm. the integrator will go away buy the robot or get the robots and the other hardware and the software and your software will be part of that mix and that software your software enables people to adjust or, or change the uh, process while the ongoing process is continuing to make the furniture and then mm. implement the new process, uh, new activity um, quickly and easily. Now, I, I'm not an expert in anything really, but I know enough to know that that was difficult in the past. Uh, people, uh, people had to switch off the production line, the robots, reprogram and then, and then uh, switch them on again, uh, which meant obviously a lot of downtime and expenses uh, occurred. But there are other simulation software, there are other simulation systems around at the moment. So it's, it's mm. uh, and I, it, although it, in many ways you're new and the first uh, in, in uh, as I say, in several ways, uh, there are others out there. What, what, what do you think of the competitive landscape? What do you think of it as competitive or do you think it's just a, an interesting and good thing that people are, are doing this kind of software and um, it makes uh, and it make, it creates an ecosystem, if you like, uh, which is beneficial to everyone? Yeah. So what sets us apart from uh, like robot, a normal robot simulator in the market is that we uh, allow the user to create like a 3D model on the spot through the iPad itself. So we are leveraging on the cameras uh, and the depth sensing on the, on the back of the iPad to allow the user to create like a 3D model within minutes so that they do not need like uh, to get their own 3D models to do uh, the robotic simulation. Uh, this allows them to cater to a very high mix production. So in the in the trend in the manufacturing uh, sector, there is a trend towards more and more high mix, low volume uh, production. So what I mean by this is that, for example, in the aerospace, MRO, uh, companies actually deal with thousands and thousands of parts and parts, they, they can differ in size and shape and different like a curvatures and so on. So if they were to 
like reprogram a robot every time manually to cater to these different parts, you will take them a lot of time. And essentially the whole system will be down just most of the time will be just programming because every unit, maybe they have like 20 or 30 units. And then after that, after the robot perform uh, the process on these 30 units, then they will switch to the new part already. So Omentus allows them to just simply take an iPad, scan the, the part, quickly generate the robot movement and do the robot uh, automation for the 30 parts. And then when the new parts come in, they repeat the process and the whole process is streamlined so that uh, whenever the part new part is, uh, comes in, it only take around 15 to 30 minutes to program. And then the whole uh, cell will just run to perf perform the process uh, until the new parts come in. So the company saves a lot of time on the robot programming. Uh, if they've solely focused on the process itself. Fascinating. Only the other day I downloaded uh, a 3D scanning app. It just suddenly occurred to me that, uh, mm. as I say, I've got this iPad Pro. When I first bought the iPad Pro, I, I didn't know what to use it for. I had no idea. You know, I'm from a different generation. I, you know, I'm from print. So I've got this iPad because I like the pencil and I, I just wondered, what, you know, it just seemed fun. Um, but I didn't really know what to use it for. And, and uh, I've, I realized only the other day that maybe there's a 3D scanning app available mm. on iPad. And I looked and I downloaded one. I still haven't used it yet. But I find that absolutely amazing, actually, uh, that uh, a device can 3D scan an object. Whereas in the past, you would have had to hire a 3D designer uh, work in Maya or some other software to create um, uh, a, a realistic digital replica or twin um, of the component or part. Uh, mm -hmm. Now you can quickly scan it. It may be the, the scanning uh, doesn't have as much detail as uh, uh, something that's created in in Maya and something, but it is functional. It will do. It, it, uh, it's um satisfactory for the for the job um, um but yeah allow i mean allow me to chip in here so the accuracy that uh, the accuracy of our scan is uh, 0 0.5 mm so it's not the so we we incorporated uh, a different technique to do the scan so it's not the lidar scan not purely the lidar scan that you get uh, from the ipad pro at the back because the LiDAR one is around 1 cm uh, accuracy, but we are able to achieve 0 0.5 mm accuracy uh, so that it's suitable for most uh, robotic applications. Hmm. Yeah, that's uh, it's, uh, very interesting. And as men, uh, uh, many um, iPad or Apple uh, users will know, the new iPad ha does have LiDAR. Doesn't it? Is it the, mm. the yeah the one that I have doesn't? It's a couple of, a few years old, but mm. I read somewhere that the new iPad has lidar. So you're saying that that uh, provides for an accuracy of um, what did you say? Uh, one centimeter. Uh, zero by five uh, mm millimeter. That, that's your that's your um, software. But what does lidar uh, allow for the accuracy? Ah, uh, uh, lidar is around one cm which is okay. 10 mm, yeah. Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, it's uh, I didn't know things like that. That's very interesting. LiDAR is uh, accurate to that. That's pretty accurate. LiDAR, as you know, is used mm. in autonomous cars a lot or, or autonomous mm. car technology. They, they've been relying on it. And one centimeter is, I don't know, yeah, it, I'm sure it's fine uh, for that level of uh, that type of function uh, application. But uh, when you're talking mm. about small parts, uh, 0 0.5 millimeter seems very very accurate you, what what are you, hmm. are you what are you i mean what what's your progress then i would imagine that that that's one of your targets to make it more and more accurate no it's not, not 0.5 millimeter obviously it's very 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 accurate but hmm. as i say if you're creating a digital twin you're probably doing it in a different application which is 100 percent accurate you know zero hmm. Uh, you know, variation. Um, I don't know what software they'd use, but um, I don't know, AutoCAD or something to create uh, design components and parts. 
And that's going to be absolutely realistic. There's not going to be any variation between the digital version and, and the actual version, you know, the, in terms of dimensions anyway. So mm -hmm. what, you're, what you're looking to in, uh, improve and innovate uh, in your software in general? Mm. Yeah, so uh, right now, our accuracy is 0.5 mm. Uh, so uh, this is suitable for a lot of applications like a spraying, sending, polishing, pick and place. Uh, however, if we want to do um, applications that require high accuracy, like welding, like uh, deburring, then we need to achieve accuracy of around 0.1 mm. So our plan to increase the accuracy uh, is to use industrial scanners and that we integrate with the iPad, uh, our software on the iPad itself, so that this will allow the user to create a digital twin uh, of very high accuracy. Uh, just now you mentioned that uh, usually people use uh, 3D models that they generate using Maya, SOLIDWORKS, uh, and so on. Uh, however, uh, 3D models generated using uh, like Maya and SOLIDWORKS are sometimes not representative of the actual uh, environment. Uh, the reason why I say this is because uh, sometimes during manufacturing, there may be deviation uh, in the parts whereby they may be slightly distorted or bent. And using 3D models sometimes may not be that accurate. However, using 3D scanning, uh, you can get the robot set up as it is, even if they are deviation in the manufacturing and the parts may be uh, like slightly different. So I would say using the scan and plan methodology uh, allows the user to not just increase the accuracy of the uh, process, but it also uh, makes it easier for the user to incorporate a simulation because they don't need to hire specialists uh, to do like uh, uh, to generate a 3D model using Maya and uh, SolidWorks. Okay, so what you're saying, we're gonna get this straight. What you're hmm. saying is somebody can use a different application to 3D scan an object and then import it into your application. Is that what you're saying? Um, our software can do the 3D scan. Yeah, but what I'm saying, if they, say if they wanted a different kind of um, different software, or mm. they've already got some 3D scans of objects and parts and components, can they mm. import it into your uh, software? Mm, yes, yeah, they can. Okay, well, what's the file format for for 3D scans these days? Mm. These days, uh, I'm not. Um, not I think the, the common ones are OBJ, uh, STL. Mm -hmm. uh, step files. Uh, I think yeah. these are the ones they are more popular right now. Yeah, I've heard of those. Yeah, yeah. So they, mm -hmm. they can, obviously those are file formats that uh, can be created or exported from 3D applications as well, like AutoCAD. Mm -hmm. So well, it's very interesting that you say a 3D, uh, something that's made in 3D, a 3D application like uh, SolidWorks or, or uh, something like that is not mm. as, um, I don't know, amenable to your the, the software because of the, uh, various uh, real world scenarios. Uh, so that, that, that's quite interesting. So um, yeah, that, so somebody can either scan or use your application for scanning and then mm. simulate the process. Let's talk about the process then once uh, the object is in in mm. place, the process of, of um, the robots doing things. What have been the challenges of designing a process and robotic work cells and things like that? Challenges as well as uh, what are the good things uh, about the, the system? What, what are the uh, capabilities of it? Um, maybe allow me to actually um, ask for a little bit deeper. Uh, the capabilities of our software to do certain application? Or... Well, yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking that you, you said the functions of welding and, and things uh, uh, mm. are something that you're working to get more accurate, but what, what are the things that can simulate now? Can it simulate more or less everything? Uh, picking and placing, I can see. Painting, I can see. Uh, mm. what, what other kind of things can people what what have people used it for so far as well what kind of mm. um, 
clients and partners have you worked with and where have you has it been integrated yeah, so we are, our customers are using us for spring uh, for example like shop shop painting sandblasting kind of application uh, so the reason why uh, they're using us for all these applications because uh, for sandblasting uh, shop painting or spraying or painting uh, the trajectory of the robot is quite complex especially on uh, products they have like uh, irregular curvature or irregular surface and therefore for example the spray path will be consisting of hundreds if not thousands of waypoints uh, for the robot to move through so it's very tedious uh, for the operator to like teach the robot point by point however using Omega software they just simply go to the part take the ipad scan and then quickly generate the robot movement uh, automatically and the robot can move uh, and do the spraying process uh, customers have also used Omentus uh, software uh, to do material handling, like pick and place, uh, and so on. So we have companies like Johnson & Johnson using Omentus to do pick and place. And then we also have companies that are using Omentus to do sending uh, application. So similar to the spring, uh, but just they go and uh, put a component there and then uh, use iPad to scan. Uh, the difference between sending and spraying is that sending is a more contact-based application that consists of uh, force control. So we have force control capability uh, inside our software so that when the user plan the path uh, or the motion for uh, robotic sending, uh, the software will help the system to compensate uh, and incorporate force control so that when the force uh, sending is being done, uh, they won't, the surface will be uniform and nice. Yep. Yeah, it's interesting. The sanding probably, I mean, that's something that is done in furniture, uh, in the furniture uh, manufacturing business. Do you, does that, uh, uh, is probably, I don't know, maybe, I don't know if, if I, you know, uh, sanding, the force control, mm -hmm. yes, is a, obviously an important aspect, but I would imagine mm. you'd need cameras to look at the sand, the, the um, surface that's being mm. sanded and mm. calculate or visually sort of uh, judge whether a part has been sanded uh, adequately or needs more sanding and so on. Are the cameras involved in this process or, or not? Mm. Yeah, so uh, for us right now, the camera is uh, not involved uh, in the process. Uh, so there are different levels of polishing and sanding. Uh, for example, uh, the sanding you're talking about, it needs to achieve a certain surface roughness. And that's why it needs to have an in-situ or uh, kind of uh, inspection process. Uh, however, there are also kind of uh, sanding or polishing applications that just uh, like, uh, like wax or polish the surface so that uh, it does not, it changes the surface uh, roughness just enough uh, to meet a certain criteria. So similar to a lot of processes, there are different requirements. And I would say different companies have different uh, expectations or specification for that process. So this is really dependent on the requirement of the company itself. Hmm. Interesting, you mentioned inspection. That's something that uh, is, is involving robots more and more. And I think uh, cameras are definitely involved in a lot of those uh, processes. So I'm sure that that's something that will be, uh, you know, called for for, you, for your software to uh, do in future. Um, mm. I imagine. So yeah, that'd be that'd be interesting to see. But let's have a click around on your website. It's, as I say, it's a very nice looking website. Great looking. Uh, um, uh -huh, thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. Great animation and 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 so on. What did you build the software with? Did you use ROS as a starting point or, um, mm. or, or is it, uh, what, what did you, if you don't mind me, I don't know if that's a confidential thing or what. Um, initially, we wanted to use ROS. So the iPad would be connected to the ROS uh, on the cloud or ROS on the PC. Um, but over time, we after we get feedback from our customers, we realized that um, a lot of customers, they don't want to have internet connectivity inside the factory, or they do not want to have a PC lying somewhere hidden. So that forces us to you know, move away from ROS. 
and purely build our own uh, robot libraries uh, to do robot simulation. So you can say we have something that is similar to ROS, but not running on a PC or Linux system. So something that is proprietary uh, to us. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I'm looking at the, um, I mean, it's very tempting for me to think about using these things, but I just wouldn't know how to use them. And, uh, you know, I've got an interest in furniture building and um, all of that kind of stuff, woodworking. And uh, as I, as we talked earlier, we, you're based in Singapore and I was, mm. I read a story, I think a year ago, about a Singapore University demonstrating a robotic system using two universal robot arms. Universal robot, that's in the picture now. Um, mm -hmm. They used two robotic arms to assemble furniture. I think it was a chair. Uh, they yeah. sort of programmed it to assemble it from a flat pack, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the flat pack uh, parts. So that was a very interesting uh, experiment, which... Um, I mean, I know that uh, big furniture stores uh, these days, they sell the flat pack and the customer at the other end uh, home is uh, supposed to assemble them. Uh, but, that, you know, there, there may be other, uh, I don't know, scenarios where a furniture assembly is something that's required. But there, there'll be other, lots and lots of other assembly um, processes where... Uh, robots are involved, have been involved for many years. So that's something that um, I imagine your software will will get into. What What's the market like? What do you think? Um, I mean, I know you said that uh, your investors, your investment means that you don't really have, you can concentrate on developing the software and, you know, uh, the, the business side of it can uh, look after itself in a way, but what what is the market like? What do you what are your projections? How do you think things will pan out for you? And so, um, as you know, yeah, uh, Singapore is a small country. So for us, uh, we plan to go global and expand into countries like uh, Japan, uh, Korea, Europe, as well as the US side, uh, so that we can uh, let more people. Uh, to have the benefit of uh, controlling robots in an easier and faster manner. Uh, so the projection wise, uh, we estimate that for example, for some of the applications like shop ending spring, and then it has around 2 billion uh, market uh, for the software integration portion. Uh, however, we also see a tremendous potential in welding uh, sector. So there are some uh, other startups uh, like uh, Path Robotics that specialize only in robotic welding. Uh, they have received a lot of traction in the US because there is a lack of robotic welders uh, over the years because less and less people want to do you know, welding because it's very difficult. It's warm, it's heaty, it's humid, and there are a lot of sparks. And there's a shortage uh, there. And we feel that there's a lot of potential in this area. And that is also the reason why uh, we want to expand into higher accuracy scanning capability so that we can tackle this uh, pretty large market. Yeah, welding is huge as a, as a market. And yeah, as you say, it's not something that attracts a lot of young people to in terms of a job choice or career choice. Um, uh, yeah, so that would be very interesting to you. In fact, I interviewed uh, a robotic welding company about a month ago, maybe two months mm. ago. Um, yeah, they offer a robotic welding system. Um, the harvesting, intelligent harvesting thing is also something I've talked to people about. And uh, I, I would imagine that requires cameras and, and you know, for, to decide the color of the fruit and the somebody from a camera company is explaining they it, the camera measures the volumetric information I suppose that means volumetric I think means size of the fruit itself um, so size and color are things that the camera can ascertain and uh, then decide whether the robot should pick that individual fruit or not I'm really looking forward to these systems coming online 
um, and becoming commercially available because something like that is is great. I mean, Singapore being a you know warm country, uh, you probably have a lot of local fruit, locally produced fruit, which is mm. picked only when ripe. In this country, uh, a lot of the fruit is picked before it's ripe on, on the tree. And then uh, it ripens in transit uh, on the way to the shop and in the shop itself. So the flavor of the fruit uh, itself is, it hasn't quite got as much flavor as a uh, fruit that's ripened on the, uh, ripened on the tree. Um, so that, that's a, a very interesting um, improvement to the quality of life that uh, robots may be able to give us fairly soon. There's at least three or four companies uh, that we've featured that have been uh, talking about uh, this kind of robotic system for fruit picking. So yeah, um, yeah, it's, a, it's a absolutely uh, very interesting. I, and I, you know, one thing I, I'll ask you, um, mm. machine tending, I keep forgetting what that means. What does machine tending mean? Yeah, so uh, machine tending means the using robot to synchronize with CNC machines. So you no know, CNC machine, you put a part in, and then CNC will cut cut it into a specific uh, shape. Uh, so machine tending means that you constantly uh, feed the metal parts into the CNC, and then take out the parts when it's done. It's almost like having a person, the operator there to sustain and operate the CNC machine. Oh, but yeah. instead of human, you use robot to uh, sub, like, um, operate it. Yeah, yeah I, uh, yeah, I remember now. It's uh, uh, I shouldn't forget from now on. Um, but uh, yeah. All right, well, um, how many of you are involved in the business uh, where you are? You're, you're, you're literally now at your office in Singapore. How many yes. of you are there and other people overseas, or is it just uh, that one office that you've got? And are you allowed to say how much investment you have received? Um, we are, the, the investment amount is undisclosed. Uh, however, we are going into the next round soon, uh, by the end of this year, uh, closing our next uh, financing round. And we started with three co-founders and right now we have around 20 uh, people in our team uh, right now in Singapore office. Um, unf unfortunately, because of COVID situation, we can't have a like, overseas team. Uh, however, when the COVID uh, situation improves, we are hoping to build different teams uh, in different countries so that we can serve our customers all over the world. Okay, and there's uh, the three co-founders, uh, yourself on the left there, Daryl Lim mm. and uh, Chong Woon Fu. Yes. Uh, so yeah, great. Um, and you've had a lot of uh, publicity as well, and, and you've got some very powerful partners uh, that you can see on the homepage and show people again. So at the bottom there, uh, it will come up in a second. Um, well, hopefully it'll come up in a second. There's ABB and uh, there we go. ABB, KUKA, Nachi, Universal, and Techman oh. Robo, all of which we are familiar with on our website. They're yep. very interesting companies. So um, is, is that something that you, uh, happened after the investment or before? I'm curious as to how you make contact with these people and partner with them. How do you mm. persuade them that you're, software or whatever you're offering is something that uh, is worth uh, partnering with or looking into at least mm -hmm. it's very difficult to get through to very big companies like this yeah so for us uh we partner with them uh because uh the robot makers they want to sell robots and in order to convince customers to adopt the ease the user experience and the ease of use are uh, very important considerations so take for example, we partner with Nachi, uh, Singapore. So we go in uh, to serve uh, some of the clients together with them because we lower the, uh, the difficulty to operate the robots. 
And this uh, fits very well with customers with high mix production, whereby they need to reprogram the robot on a consistent basis. And this, uh, we get customers and they get more sales. So it's a uh, very, I would say, mutually beneficial relationship that we have with all these uh, robot makers. Yeah, so just one last question. Um, uh, you partnering with these companies, but are they are they are, are they exclusive partnerships? Uh, are you allowed to find new partners, for example? Say if you had a brand new startup who's making robotic arms, mm. um, uh, would, you, would you be allowed to partner with them, or is it uh, you are you tied to these companies? Oh, so, well, as of right now, we are not exclusive to any brand. Uh, so we want to be compatible with uh, all robots and all brands uh, in the world eventually. And therefore, even uh, for example, in the future, a small robotic uh, startup, they make their own robot. Uh, our goal is to allow them to set up their own robot inside our app uh, itself. So they don't need to go through us. So that even you know, one day you want to make your own robotic arm with a special feature, then you just need to download the app and then configure on our app. And then you can actually have an interface for your own robotic arm. So that is our uh, goal for the future. For the future, how, how long into the future? The reason I'm asking is because, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. things are opening up in the robotic sector, um, have been for the last five years since I started working in it. And, you know, I'm sure probably probably from before, robots, industrial robots used to be very, very expensive, prohibitively expensive, half a million dollars in some cases for an individual arm. Um, you know, and they've changed a lot. Universal Robots, uh, after it launched its collaborative robot um, system range, uh, uh, the prices have gone down quite a lot and also the capability, the programming ease with which you can program or uh, not even program, you can teach it to, you know, through motion, holding it and placing it and, uh, you know, the, the, it's just a lot more accessible, the whole robotics field. So you can mm -hmm. see other robot makers coming into the market. They haven't, they probably are still quite a, a lot of them, but yeah, so you, there's a lot of disruption possibly coming up in the, in the next few years. So, I mean, when when do you think uh, uh, when do you think that feature will 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 be part of your uh, software? Yeah. So we plan to have this uh, ready by next year, uh, around Q3 next year. Uh, so, but this brings up to a very interesting topic. Uh, what, what you say is absolutely true. Uh, there are more and more robots uh, makers, especially new ones in the market. For, uh, take for example, uh, there's a new robot called Elephant Robotics. So it offers like a miniature robotic arm that costs around $1,000. Uh, we are starting to see some of the companies in the startup side they are adopting elephant robotics in their projects. Sorry, uh, elephant, was it, what's the, what's the name? Elephant robotics. Yes, elephant robotics. Mm -hmm. uh, a small robotic arm, very, very affordable. Uh, so we are starting to see there's a trend whereby there is a possibility robotic arms could become a consumer product instead of an enterprise product. So because of the lowering of the costs uh, and then uh, the increased uh, performance and so on. And we also are seeing people using like uh, cheaper robotic arms to do toilet cleaning. I mean, I've, I would definitely love to buy that solution. <laughs> because, <laughs> because my wife always asks me to, ask me to clean the toilet no, every weekend. I mean, uh, it's not a very pleasant task. So nice. if robots can help me do it, I will. I would love it. And if they can program the robot to clean toilets using Aumentus app, that will be something that we wish we can assist and collaborate with them as well in the future. Yeah. That is a very, very, um, I don't know, really uh, plausible 
uh, scenario uh, developing in my mind. I mean, there's a lot of people studying or researching how robots can be used in the home. And I know that there's little humanoid robots with wheels and they use for security and things like that. Mm. But the idea of uh, doing menial tasks uh, around the house, cleaning tasks and so on, obviously we've got uh, the robot vacuum cleaners and robot mops and things like that. But there's, there seems more opportunity for robotics in the home but without making it uh, affordable and easy to use it's not going to happen and um, mm. yeah if your if your software gets to a point where you can uh, literally uh, uh, you know download apps for toilet cleaning and get the appropriate robot uh, and and uh, just press play and or you uh, you know go I um, mean, you can do it. Yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, there's lots of tasks around the house that I'd like to be help with as well. But all right. Well, that, that's a very interesting and great thing to look forward to, possibly. So I'll be watching out for it. Um, thanks uh, for your time and uh, your insights. Is there anything that I maybe should have asked about that you want to say that, that you, you know, that you maybe want to? Um, yeah, I, I think you asked uh, excellent questions, and I think the questions really bring out uh, the specialty and the uniqueness of Amentus, and I'm really grateful for that. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate your uh, insights too. I mean, it's uh, as I say, right from the beginning, I think the fact that you use an iPad, it's iPad native and use the M1, uh, that's fascinating as well. The, M1 is the chip, uh, for those who might not know, M1 is a new type of chip that Apple itself has um, uh, created or built or uh, whatever. It's moving away from using chips from other companies. So that's, uh, yeah, is that, that's something that programmers are like, uh, you, you know, people with experience in programming will understand that uh, certain chips can do certain things. So that's... Uh, Oh, it's very interesting, very innovative, very, very advanced. So congratulations on your achievements so far. Thank you. Okay, well, I'll speak to you another time. And uh, yeah, take care of yourself. Okay, looking forward. Send us an email at sales at robotics and automation news .com to register for one of our many upcoming webinars. And if you'd like us to host your webinar, we have a range of options, including long-term lead generation packages and marketing campaigns. We look forward to hearing from you soon.